The larger the gluing surface, the stronger the glue joint. That's a rule that many woodworkers live by. And while it's true generally, it isn't true always. The strength of a glue joint depends on a great deal more than real estate. Ow. A glue joint is the marriage of two completely different materials, two or more pieces of wood and various amounts of glue. Wood itself is a composite of yet two more materials, cellulose fibers and a glue-like polymer called lignin, which holds the fibers together. The cellulose fibers create a distinct grain pattern with a clear direction. Wood is strongest along its grain parallel to the fibers. Cellulose and lignin have different strengths. It's relatively easy to split wood along its grain, breaking the lignin bonds, but much harder to break it across the grain, snapping the cellulose fibers. In engineering parlance, wood is heterogeneous, not the same throughout, and anisotropic, strong in one direction. Glue couldn't be more different. It is the same in every direction. It is homogeneous and isotropic, but it does change from a liquid to a solid when it cures. The little liquidy molecules cross-link with each other to form larger solid molecules in a process called polymerization. But there's something else that happens to these materials when you make a glue joint. It's called penetrative adherence. Under the pressure of the clamps, the glue penetrates into the wood. As it cures, the glue forms an interface with the wood fibers, and it's this interface that really gives the joint its strength. You can talk all you want to about the relative strength of the materials, cellulose, lignin, and glue, but when you put them all together, well, let's just say that the interface is more than the sum of its parts. Now there's one more thing that it's good to know about glue joints. Glue has two types of strength. The first is adhesion, the strength with which it bonds to a surface, such as this piece of plastic. In wood, this is what happens in the interface. The second is cohesion, the strength with which the cured glue molecules hold onto each other, the crosslinks. That's what's going on in the glue line between the two adhered surfaces. In most glue joints, adhesion contributes more strength than cohesion. That's why we want this joint to cure under pressure. No pressure and we may be able to peel the glue off the wood, or the wood off the glue. The clamps not only force the glue to penetrate the wood and form an interface, they also make the glue line as thin as possible. However, there are a few glues, such as epoxy and cyanoacrylate, that don't need to cure under pressure because their cohesion is every bit as tenacious as their adhesion. What happens if you don't clamp a glue joint that should cure under pressure? Well, the interface isn't as deep, there isn't enough adhesion, and the joint is weaker than it should otherwise be. Let me show you an experiment that you can do with some wood scraps and prove this to yourself. For this assembly, I simply laid one board across another and let the glue cure. The joint lets go easily. This one cured under clamping pressure, and it takes a great deal more force to break it. You will be surprised at the difference. By the way, I'm going to use a single glue for all the demonstrations I'm about to perform. Type Bond 2, a popular aliphatic resin or yellow glue. This will keep all the results simple and comparable. There are many more types of glue, of course, but that's a topic for another time. And I hope you enjoyed our adventure in adhesive vocabulary, but that's enough 50 cent words for any one video. The takeaway here is that in order to make a strong glue joint, there is more to consider than just the gluing surface. You need to consider the properties of the wood, the properties of the glue, and the condition under which the glue cures. Perhaps the most important property to consider when engineering a wooden joint is grain direction. As I mentioned, Wood is strongest along the grain, and you must align the grain in the joint so that it best resists the forces that will be applied to it. There are four forces that can tear a wooden joint apart. And here are some examples. Tension. This is when you are trying to pull the pieces of a glued assembly apart. Compression. 
the assembly must resist a force that's trying to collapse it. Here, the pieces in an assembly must not slide past one another. Racking. The pieces must remain at the proper spatial relationship to one another when a force tries to deform the assembly. By far, the most destructive of those forces is racking. You're using one or more members in an assembly as a lever to magnify the force and weaken or possibly break the glue joint. And that's the force that we will be applying in our tests. And we're going to start with an extremely simple test to make a point about grain direction. A wood joint can be extremely weak if you get the grain direction wrong. I've made several loose tenon joints. A loose tenon straddles two mortises, one in each board. In one joint, the grain of the tenon runs across the joint, and in the other, it runs parallel to the joint. And this is our base, or zero point. There's no tenon in this at all. I've simply glued the boards end to edge. To this, we're going to add just one more loose tenon joint. This is to answer a question that keeps popping up. If glue is so strong, why don't we just make everything out of glue? Well, in this, I made the tenon out of epoxy glue. I had to use a two-part adhesive because I never would have gotten aliphatic resin glue, tight bond, to cure. I filled the mortises with epoxy and then I quickly clamped the boards together so the mortises were aligned. I had drilled two small holes in the sides of the mortises, sprue holes, so that I could add more epoxy as needed to make sure that the mortises were completely filled. I've clamped the assembly in a vise so that one part is horizontal. Exactly 12 inches, or 300 millimeters away, I've attached an engine hoist that will lift the horizontal part and put a racking stress on the joint. When the joint snaps, a dynamometer will record the maximum force applied. We're going to record the results in kilograms to make them sound more important. But I want to emphasize that this is just a demonstration. For scientific results, we'd have to do these tests over and over again about a million times. I'd have to wear a white lab coat, and we'd have to record these in newtons instead of kilograms. First, our base, or zero point, with no tenon whatsoever. Then, the loose tenon joint with the grain of the tenon running across the joint. There it is. Then the joint where the grain runs parallel to the joint. And finally the joint where the tenon is made from epoxy. From this, we can conclude two things. First of all, glue is not stronger than wood, nor is it necessarily correct to say that wood is stronger than glue. For most common adhesives, it's the interface between the two materials that gives the joint its strength. And second, the joint is stronger with a wooden tenon as long as the grain runs across the joint. You can see how easily the lignin split here compared to the cellulose. And this applies to all joints where there is some sort of tenon, round or square. You will definitely pick up more strength with an increased gluing surface, but your primary concern should be grain direction. Joints that involve end grain are often weaker than, are, than those that are long grain only. The reason is that end grain wicks up glue faster than long grain. The areas where the interface should be forming, those are often starved for glue. Minor joints are considered end grain joints, and some craftsmen feel the need to reinforce them with splines. These splines rest in grooves. This is a great way to align the boards and increase the gluing surface. It also adds some long grain to long grain gluing surface in the faces of the spline grooves, and this too bumps up the strength of the joint. But here again, you need to pay close attention to grain direction. It's easiest to make these splines by ripping them from a board. 
but in doing so, the grain runs through the length of the spline. And when you insert the spline in the groove, the grain runs parallel to the miter joint. It adds very little strength, if any at all. You need to either cut the spline so the wood grain runs across the joint, or use plywood so that at least some of the wood grain runs across the joint. Let's test all of these spline options. Here's a miter joint with no spline to reinforce it. This miter joint has a spline with the grain running parallel to the joint. This one has a plywood spline And this has a spline in which the wood grade runs across the miter. The numbers show that the parallel spline is no better than no spline at all. The plywood spline adds significant strength, but the cross grain spline is the strongest of all of them. Once again, your primary concern should be grain direction. You should also be aware of a simple gluing technique that can increase the strength of any end grain joint. Remember I told you the end grain tends to wick up the glue and starve the joint? Well, to prevent this from happening, apply the glue twice. Spread the glue on the end grain and let it soak in for 10 to 15 minutes. Then apply a little more. Put the joint together and clamp it up like you would normally. Let's do an experiment to see how this technique affects the strength of an end grain joint. I've cut down the size of the joint from a 2x4 to a 2x2 so that it doesn't max out our dynamometer. First, an end grain joint that has been glued just once. Next, a joint that has been glued twice. Our test showed that the strength of an end grain joint that had been glued once was inconsistent. It failed between 31 and 51 kilograms, depending on how much glue had been wicked up. But the end grain joint that had been glued twice failed between 59 and 60 kilograms, almost maxing out our little dynamometer. It was always measurably stronger than the joint that had been glued once. But the strength didn't come from grain direction. It came from a modest change in our gluing technique. When designing a wood joint, especially one with a lot of gluing surface, you need to be mindful of wood movement. Wood is fairly stable, parallel to its grain, but it can expand and contract up to 8% of its width across the grain with changes in relative humidity. A 12 inch wide board can expand and contract almost a full inch if the humidity swings between 0% and 100%. In metric, that's a 300 millimeter wide board expanding and contracting 24 millimeters. In reality, it never goes that far. But if the relative humidity in your area swings just 30% summer to winter, then you can expect a wide board like this to expand and contract 1 8 of an inch to a quarter of an inch, that's three millimeters to six millimeters in a year's time. And that will put some stress on the glue joints. Fortunately, craftsmen have developed some rules of thumb to help us deal with that. One of the most important is that when gluing two boards together in which the grain of one board is perpendicular to the grain of the other, you keep the glue joint under three inches or 75 millimeters wide and long. Most glues like this tight bond here are flexible enough that they will allow for the movement that can be expected from a three inch or 75 millimeter wide board. Any wider than that and the movement starts to affect the glue strength. Each new cycle of expansion and contraction will make the joint weaker until it eventually fails. I'm talking about both strength and durability here. Well, what should you do when you have to join a wide board to another with the grain contrary? Consider dividing the gluing surface into two or more separate joints. 
This is what a split mortise and tenon joint is all about. This board is eight inches or 200 millimeters wide. If I were to join it to the other with a single tenon, that, that tenon might be more than seven inches across. There would be way too much wood movement inside that joint and eventually the wood would split or the glue joint would fail. So I've split the tenon into two parts and cut two mortises in the adjoining part to match it. There is still a lot of tension, compression, and shear on the wide board as it expands and contracts. But the individual joints, they are under considerably less stress and they will hold together in spite of the wood movement. If I think there's enough stress to split the wide board, I'll cut one of the two mortises long and leave the tenon in it unglued, a floating tenon. I'll also leave the shoulders unglued. That way the board can expand and contract freely with no tension in the joint at all. This is one of those rare circumstances where instead of increasing the gluing surface, decreasing it is the better choice. This doesn't make the joint stronger, of course, but it does increase the overall durability of the assembly. And as you can see by the examples that I've shown you, making a good glue joint isn't a simple matter of having a lot of gluing surface. You have to take into consideration grain direction, type of grain, and wood movement. And then just design something that covers all those wood properties I just mentioned and some that I haven't. I cover this in a great deal more detail in my book, Woodworking Wisdom, which we've just made available in digital format at our bookstore. There's a link in the description or you can go to the homepage of our website, workshopcompanion.com. And if you like any of the tools you've seen here, including this cute little dynamometer, Click Tool Recommendations on our homepage, and that will take you to the Amazon Affiliate Store. Your purchases are much appreciated because they keep us doing what we're doing. So please, like, subscribe, and buy something to keep those videos coming. And, as always, thank you for your kind attention.